Everybody could have a seat. Good evening, my name is Stephen Power, and I'm standing in for Earl Heal, who's the president of the Solano County Taxpayers Association, which is sponsoring this event. Before I make my introductions, I'd like to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance and then a brief invocation. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please remain standing and bow our heads. Almighty God, we acknowledge our dependence on Thee and beg Thy blessing upon these candidates, our elected local and state officials, and our beloved country, the United States of America. Amen. Amen. This evening we have with us uh, the distinguished supervisor, Mike Reagan, the incumbent, and his opponent, Mr. Uh, Skip Thompson, who is a former supervisor. Our moderator tonight is Mr. Jim Wil Williams. Jim, could you come up, please? Our timekeeper is Ms. Bernice Kalin. And Robin Miller is uh, going to be selecting questions. If anybody wants to make a question, we have cards there. And hand them to Robin or, and over there, various places. And she's going to make a selection of the most appropriate. So without further ado, it's all yours, Jim. Thank you. Christine. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This event is scheduled for an hour and a half. The rules are as follows. Candidates will draw straws for sequence. The candidate with the long straw, A, will make the opening statement first. The candidate with the short straw, B, will go first with his closing statement. Each candidate has five minutes for opening. The timer will illuminate the, uh, the green light when a question is asked or presented to a, a candidate, and the red light will illuminate automatically when the speaker's time is expired. While the candidates are making opening statements, the audience is invited to write down questions on cards to give to the host ushers. Please raise your hand now if you would like uh, to prepare a question. Questions must be legible and printed on one side of the card only. They must pertain to supervisor's responsibilities or issues of current interest to the Board of Supervisors and must be applicable to both candidates. Our selection panel will screen the selection questions against that criteria. The forum committee has prepared a number of questions. The moderator will present each question. Each candidate has up to two minutes to answer. Candidate A will be on the first question and then alternating for, second, for subsequent questions. Then I will ask the audience for their questions, uh, which will be presented to me as, as you've written them. And candidate B will be first uh, for that portion. Okay. And you thought we really weren't going to have straws, huh? Go <laughs> ahead. I don't know. <laughs> I think you are first. I'm going first. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Well, I'll ask you now for your opening statement. Well, thank you very much, and uh, <clears throat> I want to thank everyone for attending and for the uh, Sonal Taxpayer Association for putting on the forum. I see some familiar faces in the audience, but some not so familiar, so I'd like to introduce myself. Uh, my, my family came here in 1962. I was a young man at that time. Went to school here in uh, Fairfield, graduating from Fairfield High School in 1968. I went into the service and spent four years in the Army. I joined the Vietnam War. After my uh, service in the Army, I went to Solano Community College, graduated in 1972, and then graduating from UC Davis in 1976. 
Uh, while I was a student at UC Davis, I was also a correctional officer with the Solano County Sheriff's Department. My wife, Gail, and I have two sons, uh, Lauren and Brandon. We're very proud of them. Lauren is a deputy sheriff here in Solano County, and he's also an Iraqi uh, veteran. Our youngest son, Brandon, is going to school in San Diego and working on his master's degree. The issue that is first and foremost in this debate is going to be the $15 million structural deficit that the county is facing. I have a plan to cut almost $3 million of that, and that will come without laying off one employee or raising one fee. But I'd like to say that um, campaigns are like telling a story. This story started when my opponent made a promise to us. And his promise was, and I'm quoting from his reflections, that I will get county employee salaries under control. He goes on to say that the existing seven county comparables has caused a vicious upward spiral in salaries. In December of 08, after much criticism, my opponent uh, voted to eliminate the management incentive program, commonly known as the PIP, or MIP bonus program. And I know a little bit about it because it was started when I was on the Board of Supervisors and it was tied to the economy. We we're losing top administrators and we needed to figure out a way of keeping them. We came up with a management incentive program. But there was no place in it after 08 when our economy crashed after the Wall Street crash. <clears throat> At the time that um, the MIP came before the board to, uh, dealing with the county administrator and county council, the county administrator himself was receiving $28,000. And my opponent, rightfully so, voted to eliminate the MIP. But what he didn't tell you, and he didn't tell the taxpayers, is he backfilled that 28000 with a $65,000 raise. That comes in on the heels of a 4.7% raise just three months before that. So in three months, my opponent voted to raise the county administrator's salary $77,000. For the next 20 months, my opponent voted against eliminating the MIP program for the highest paid employees in the county of Solano. That decision cost us another million dollars, $50,000 a month times 20 months. However, he did acquiesce after much criticism from the public and he, he decided to eliminate the MIP for all the managers in the county. But what he also failed to tell us is that he backfilled that MIP with another pay raise in excess of $159,000. Again, for the highest paid employees in the county and when we're laying off employees and cutting services. Last week at the Vacaville Chamber of Commerce, my opponent stated that management in the county has taken between a 15 and a 30% pay cut. Well, I've got a, I've got a, a spreadsheet and uh, coincidentally, it's marked confidential because this is something that m my opponent does not want you to hear. 163 employees between the time of June, 9th, uh, June of 09 and August of 11 received $1.4 million in pay raises. Again, my, my opponent takes great pride in saying he's streamlined the county government, laid off 650 employees and has raised 169 fees in excess of $150,000. Also in that form, my opponent says he's taken an 18% pay cut. Well, uh, in the first two years that he was on the Board of Supervisors, his salary went from $79,000 to $95,000, a 20% increase in his salary alone, hardly an 18% pay cut. But I'd like to say, when I served as a member of the Board of Supervisors, I made decisions that I felt were best for our communities. When developers got too close to Travis Air Force Base, I fought them. When Child Protective Services failed, I reorganized them. And when I served on the Delta Protection Commission, I fought to make sure the Delta was protected. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, and I uh, too would like to thank uh, the Taxpayers Association and uh, Travis Credit Union for hosting this and the Vacaville Community TV uh, for their service and all of you for taking the time to come on out and uh, meet the candidates and get educated. And I'd like to thank my wife, Joni, for 
coming and, uh, and joining us here again tonight. Um, I too uh, moved to this area. The Air Force brought me out here in 91. I served from 71 to 99, uh, eight year, last eight years at Travis. And we have two daughters, uh, both of whom still live with us here at home, 125 and 121, and uh, pride of our lives. So, uh, and uh, I guess as Ronald Reagan said uh, to uh, Jimmy Carter back in the 88 uh, presidential debates, there you go again. It's, um, you know, the people of this county deserve truthfulness, not mudslinging. Uh, the campaign is about leadership of the county, uh, keeping your word to the voters, making tough decisions to protect taxpayers and doing what local government can do to help entrepreneurs lead our economic recovery. First, uh, we've been leading by example. We've been protecting the taxpayers' money. Uh, Skip is talking about um, figures in isolation. Actually, the uh, leadership of the county in the last uh, the the 150 people that he's talking about, it's actually a few a bit smaller than that now. Uh, they've actually taken a cumulative net reduction in total compensation, their total pay and benefits of about $2.4 million over the last three years. The, uh, we've been making the, the tough decisions on how we reorganize and downsize the military, uh, the, uh, the staff of the, of the County to basically come up with the uh, parallel reduction to the reduction in the tax revenues that are coming in. Uh, so it's about an 18 and a half percent reduction in revenues, and it's about the same in reduction in the number of employees. Um, and that's at the same time that some of the increases in our social services programs. Uh, because of uh, the distress in our community and some of the increases that we had with public safety realignment. So there's other things that are going down farther while other things are coming up. Um, we've um, protected public safety and that's going to become more and more important as public safety realignment uh, brings uh, more hundreds of uh, felons into our community that are gonna to have to be supervised by the county staff. Uh, we've prepaid debt, doubled our reserve target from what it was established by previous boards, uh, fixed the appalling conditions of our health and human services and veterans facilities that are not right there by the county seat, established a local preference purchasing po policy, updated our general plan and our airport plan, and there's many other achievements. Personally, um, I've given up a greater percentage of my pay and benefits than all but a handful of county employees. And it is 18% at this point uh, from what it was when the Great Recession started. Because I don't believe I can ask our employees to take a cut if I'm not willing to take one myself. Uh, second, we've been building solutions locally, working together to have, help our private sector um, investors and businessmen uh, lift us up by our bootstraps. We've had five years of community-wide summits to have a discussion on what's needed, and we've made county investments in economic development solutions that work. In the past few recession years, Solano County expressed, has experienced, you don't see this a lot, a net 0.8% in local private sector employment growth. While the Sacramento region saw a 1.5% loss, the rest of the Bay Area saw a 12.4% loss and statewide a 4.7% loss. Yes, government uh, jobs have declined in a direct refle reflection of the uh, decline in government revenues. State government, regional government, federal government uh, have not been our friends in the last several years. The, most, the more effective we will be, we can be in backing them out of our business, um, the more successful we will be as a community because the solutions are gonna come from right here. And I think that's the end of my time, thank you. Thank you, gentlemen.
I would ask, uh, now that we've had our introductions, and uh, that the audience please refrain from uh, applause or uh, while we're asking these questions so we can move on to the next one given the time constraints. Appreciate it. Okay, our first question. Um, Mr. Thompson. Given the county's revenue losses and budget problems, do you favor t increasing taxes? And if yes, give one tax that you would recommend. If no, some functions that will have to be cut back or eliminated. Let me say I'm not particularly uh, fond of raising taxes in this environment, but one of the taxes that I will be supporting is Measure L, our libraries. And I say that because when I was a member of the Board of Supervisors, Measure L was first placed on the ballot, and our a librarian at that time, Ann Cousineau, uh, made certain statements and certain promises to the taxpayers. If they were to pass that, uh, that tax, what they would do with that money. And like uh, many of us, when promises made, you should keep those promises. Uh, we kept it as a board, and uh, our library system is what it is today. So that would be probably the only tax I would be supporting in this environment right now. Thank you. Um, I, I'm also a supporter of Measure L. Uh, I think uh, it's a continuation of an existing funding stream. It's about 45% of the operating budgets of our libraries, and uh, I'm not sure that any of us would uh, want to lose what we would have to cut if, we, if that tax isn't con continued. At, at the uh, fees that Mr. Uh, Thompson was talking about are the annual inflation adjustments on fees as they go through so that we keep up with what the costs are rather than uh, lurch every couple of years and have huge increases uh, when that goes. So those are the kinds of um, taxes and fee increases that uh, I will support. I will not support a countywide tax measure um, or, uh, quite frankly, the tax measure on the state ballot or some of the other things that, that are in June or, or either of them that will be on the, on the ballot in uh, November. Um, this is not the time, and California is definitely not the place for these kinds of uh, tax increases. We are already uh, uh, burdened by a uncompetitive taxation rate in this uh, state um, with our surrounding states and by on international standards. Uh, this uh, nation and the California has created a horribly um, uh, adverse econ economic climate for job creators, and uh, we need to draw back on that, not increase the burden. Thank you. Next question, um, Supervisor Reagan. Some elected officials are subject to term limits. Would you favor a ballot measure limiting the term of county supervisors? Please explain. Um, that's obviously going to be something that would be a, a voter initiative. And uh, uh, right now, I am not in favor of one. I don't have a philosophical objection to term limits. and um, But I'm not going to be committing tonight to a limit on myself. Um, the. Um, you know, conversely, the uh, the the term limit uh, initiative that will be on the June ballot, which basically converts uh, the existing term limits for state legislators to a 12-year um, ability to serve in either house, I, I am not in favor of. Um, it basically uh, would perpetuate some of the uh, uh, the shenanigans that go on by the current crop of uh, legislators we have in in uh, Sacramento. Uh, term limits have been found to be um, unconstitutional at the federal level. Uh, but your question was about local government, and uh, no, I am not in favor of uh, term limits imposed. Uh, uh, I do think that uh, most uh, 
members have basically worn out their welcome after three or four terms. Okay. I've always said that the way we uh, limit someone's term is we vote him or her out. And that's what we need to do if we um, don't like the current uh, supervisor. We can vote him out. And so I would, uh, I would say that I, too, am uh, philosophically opposed to term limits. But I'd also like to respond to uh, politicians doing shenanigans, if you will, uh, like redrawing district lines to benefit your reelection, like my opponent did in the 5th uh, District uh, Soup District. Thank you. Next question. Mr. Thompson, um, do, you, do public employee unions have a fiduciary responsibility to taxpayers? And if so, what are those responsibilities? Well, that's a pretty broad question. Um, I would say depending on the, on the, um, the uh, classification they hold, but certainly there is a health and uh, health issues that under HIPAA are not uh, allowed to be uh, disclosed. So I would say those certainly would uh, have a fiduciary uh, relationship. And um, aside from that, I think uh, you know, the public uh, deserves to know what their government's doing. So uh, you know, uh, there's been a big to-do about Curtis Hunt and him disclosing some of the, the information to the public. Uh, you know, most of the information that uh, Curtis Hunt released, as I understand it, was public information. And the problem we get into is when we do not have transparency in government. It's when people start cutting deals and the public is left out of the information process and is not able to uh, share their concerns or their opinions on certain things. So I hope that answers that question. Thank you, Mr. Right, right. Um, you know, a fiduciary responsibility, I think, on all public employees to uh, provide value for, you know, the taxpayer money that they are um, being paid with. Uh, obviously, you have different roles for different employees and different uh, uh, responsibilities, but all of them have a responsibility to provide value. Um, probably one of the... Uh, One of the uh, issues is on what you know, wise and uh, frugal spending of uh, things on supplies and contracts, and the responsibility to protect uh, the taxpayers from uh, misspending or um, uh, exorbitant uh, issues on uh, on travel or some of those things. That's one of the things that I've worked on early in my first term is uh, we had a series of uh, problems with um, with people uh, actually spending a bit uh, beyond their uh, their uh, their travel allowance and when they were traveling on trips and we actually changed the county's policy to bring that down to that's what they were getting reimbursed and uh, we, we tightened up the, the travel policies and those kinds of things to uh, prevent those kind of abuses. And, um, you know, I think we've, uh, we've actually had uh, a pretty good uh, uh, run with a whistleblower program that our auditor controller has put together, which has uh, been a great way of uh, finding uh, out things that needed to be checked up on. Thank you. Okay, our next question is, uh, Mr. Reagan, it's for you. Many citizens say the compensation for government officials, especially pensions, is excessive. What do you say? Explain. I, our employees are well paid. That's not. I don't think that's not a, an issue. Uh, they, uh, there is ties wherever possible to the private sector. When we're doing our salary sur surveys, um, a lot of the public sector doesn't provide. The private sector doesn't provide the benefit package. So the total compensation package is uh, is uh, 
is a good package. Now, if we have a highly productive and professional and customer uh, focused workforce, I think they're worth the money. Um, one of the things that we are doing right now as we're reacting to the decrease in tax revenues is we are doing a lot of training of our employees and modification uh, process optimization to uh, basically be able to do the work with less uh, fewer employees but more highly productive employees um, I think as we continue on this path of uh, improving that, uh, giving our employees the tools to increase their uh, their caseload and uh, do things in a much more uh, efficient and uh, productive manner, I think is a is where we have to go. The um, we will be paying a competitive wage with the other agencies with whom we compete for staff. Uh, we have uh, a we have expanded uh, our look at from whom we are recruiting people and to whom we are losing people so that we're not stuck in a static um, six county study and we're not bidding each other up the way we were before and I think we have basically adjusted our salary and total comp packages to the market as best as we're able could you repeat the question, please? Certainly. Many citizens say that compensation for government officials, especially pensions, is excessive. What do you say? And explain, please. Well, I just want to remind you of the promise that our supervisor gave us, that he was going to look at the seven county comparables because they've caused a vicious spiral upwards. Well, I'm looking at attachment F from a budget hearing and which uh, dated January 2010. And I'm looking at $159,000 worth of salary increases to the top 14 managers. And what was used? A seven county comparable study. It's a self-fulfilling uh, prophecy, as you say. Um, the top managers in Solano County have done very well over the last two or three years. And uh, I will share with you a lot of numbers over, over this evening. The, the folks at the, uh, at the bottom, have really supported those at the top. And so um, the, the issue of losing managers to other counties is not happening. The counties, most counties have, and cities, have uh, instituted a two-tier system. If you're at 2% or 2 percent or 2.7 at 55, you're not gonna go to another county that is now 3% at 60. So when I heard some of the supervisors say that they had to compensate uh, some specific classifications because they were afraid to lose them. Some of the, the, some of the employees in those classifications said to me, that's a joke. We're not going anywhere because that two-tier system means we would lose a lot of our retirement. So we need to look very closely at compensation, especially as it relates to the top managers in Solano County. And when I'm elected, uh, one of the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to start by leading, like what my uh, opponent said. I'm going to be asking the board for a $25,000 cut in the Board of Supervisors salary. That's leadership. It's not a 10% a, uh, voluntary pay cut that this board took in this most recent budget. Yeah, thank you. Hey, Mr. Thompson, this is a two-part question, okay. so I will ask the timekeeper at this time if uh, she will add uh, 30 seconds to, a, in other words, uh, let me explain. In each part of this question, you will get, be given a minute and 30 seconds to answer, okay. so that we cover both sides, or both parts of it. If, uh, is the uh, timekeeper ready? Okay. Thank you. Okay, what can the Board of Supervisors do to strengthen our local economy in the area of regulations? Well, as I walk around the district, some would say we're overregulated, to be quite honest. You know, I think we need to use a little bit of common sense when it comes to regulation. Uh, some, some of the, um, the building trades folks that I talk to 
talk about excessive building regulations that make no sense. You know, and, and as I go around older parts of cities, uh, Gail and I have been traveling a bit, and we see these uh, structures that have been around for 100 years. They're still there. Yet building in inspection has increased to a point where it seems overly uh, um, prohibitive to build anything. Uh, you know, and don't get me wrong, I'm not saying we don't need regulation, but I'm saying we need to have common sense when it comes to regulation. So uh, until I'm actually confronted with a reg, and when I was on the board, there were some regulations that I opposed and some that I thought were just common sense and, and good for those that we represent. So that would be that, that answer on that question. Thank you. And second part of this question then, um, what can the Board of Supervisors do to strengthen our local economy in the area of litigation? Well, we live in a very litigious uh, state, don't we? Um, you know, I, I think what we need to do is oftentimes, uh, I think, and many of us probably can put ourselves in that situation, is that the last resort is having to, to, go to go into court because we haven't been able to negotiate some sort of a settlement. And so sometimes we're just forced into our courts to, to allow them to decide what is best uh, for the two parties. Uh, I, I would say personally, litigation has always been the last resort. And uh, you know, oftentimes um, we tend to litigate in government because it's easy way out. We'll, give, we'll pay someone off instead of going to court. And sometimes, uh, like many of us, you, you need to stand up for principle and you need to fight these uh, frivolous lawsuits that are filed at the, at the county or city government or state government. So uh, again, uh, it's, it's a broad question and I would say uh, you take each one of those, uh, those lawsuits um, as they come and some you will settle and others, uh, I think we just need to go, go to the mat, as they say, and fight them because there is principal involved and taxpayers' money. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, strengthening the economy in the area of regulations, we've been uh, doing a lot of work on that at the county. Uh, just end of February, we actually uh, approved a whole series of a uh, our zoning. Uh, regulations that, that affect uh, the businesses and residents in in the unincorporated area. Um, we uh, basically are implementing the, uh, the freedom that we gained in the rewrite of our general plan to actually uh, enable uh, additional uh, value-added processing in uh, the farms and uh, to uh, uh, create zones within Sassoon uh, Valley or Green Valley or uh, Paradise Valley where we've, and in, you know, up in the Dixon Ridge, we have 10 different agricultural zones where we're going through one by one and, and identifying areas where we could uh, host uh, the kinds of value-added processes that'll help those areas grow. We've also done quite a bit of work with windmills to actually uh, create a standard template on how those windmills would uh, go through our regulatory process and we've streamlined that quite a bit and I think my uh, time is up. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. The second part of the question, and we'll also be giving a minute and a minute and one half it's regarding litigation. Litigation. This is a litigious uh, society. One of the uh, one of the most uh, egregious examples of that is all the uh, ADA, American with Disabilities Act litigation that's going on. Uh, we have some lawyers out of Lodi who are predating small businesses in Rio Vista. We have people in Sacramento and Dixon predating uh, businesses in Fairfield and Vacaville. We have people coming out of Oakland that are getting into Venetia and, and, uh, and basically it's an extortion racket. And they're taking advantage of slight differences between the federal and the state laws and they're uh, exploiting the, dif the differences and uh, basically totally destroying the economic activity of the major, uh, the major component of the employer base in our county, which is small employers. Uh, another area that um, we have a problem with litigation is we have so many people that uh, after there is a uh, 
a lengthy public process uh, to approve something that will actually contribute to the economic health of our of our county. We have the people who just won't take no for an answer and they just keep coming back and suing and suing and suing, tying things up for decades afterwards. We're seeing that in Mill Green Valley, we're seeing it on Patrol Hill Landfill, we're seeing it on a, a bunch of other examples. Thank you. At, at this time, I would uh, invite you both to uh, uh, take a short minute. Uh, for your glass, I'd like to read some of the questions from the audience. Uh, I'd like to drink the water and uh, give me a moment to do. And I have three questions from the audience. So, <clears throat> to begin this session, um, uh, Supervisor Reagan, you <clears throat> excuse me. I'll begin with you. What do you plan to do to eliminate the structural deficit and, I'm sorry. <laughs> how soon? Oh, and how soon will the budget be back, <clears throat> excuse me, in balance? So I can repeat that if you like. What do you... What's the plan? Yeah. <laughs> the, um, uh, again, the structural deficit is a difference in the projected revenues and the projected spending. Spending is um, kind of uh, the calculation of uh, projected uh, caseload and our current cost and how we're going to execute that. We've been very, very successful in, um, in modifying processes so they're not as expensive and we've actually, uh, um, we actually put $13 million in savings from what was authorized by the board back into reserves. We swept it and we put it back into reserves at the beginning of this fiscal year. Um, we basically have uh, a combination of controls on expenditures. We have a hiring freeze on that basically uh, it's almost a case by case, position by position. Dis deliberation on whether or not we're going to fill a position, and in most cases, it's only those that uh, are absolutely critical or are funded by non-general fund issues. This is a general fund problem, uh, but we do have structural deficits in the library and in the road fund and uh, some of the other funds. So um, we have that freeze. We have. Uh, uh, we're re reviewing uh, programs that we get mandatory laws that tell us that we have to do it. Some of them they tell us how to do it. Some of them they give us discretion on how we do it. Some are uh, uh, discretionary, like running a jail. That's discretionary. But once you do it, then you get this whole panoply of man mandatory things. So we have to actually look at the 700 plus programs we do and actually decide how we're going to do those. We've got a plan. We're working through it. It'll get done. Uh, we're probably going to take another $9 million out this year of the 15. Um, we have the reserves to be able to do this for another couple of years. We're doing it in a way where we're streamlining the activities to accommodate the workload. Thank you, Jim. My opponent talks about sweeping at the end of the year. Sweeping means nothing more than taking what's left over in the budget and sweeping it into the general fund. And when you over budget, you certainly can have money you can sweep into, the, into your general fund. But the question was, how are we going to address the structural deficit? Now remember, we've been around an $18 million structural deficit for the last three and a half years. It may be down to $15 million now. Um, my opponent said nothing. But what we know, freeze, freeze uh, positions, don't hire new positions. I've actually got a plan. Uh, $125,000, uh, cutting the board's uh, supervisor's salary by $25,000. Cutting out the car allowance. How many of you are paid to go to work by your employer? That's another 52000 
admin leave. That is $800,000. And admin, admin leave is nothing more than it, that at the end of the year, you cash out and put your money into a health care fund. So when you retire, you can use that money to fund your health care premiums. Longevity, $1.2 million in longevity. 401As, now this is only for 179 employees. 401A, another $215,000. And then finally, the employer paid uh, member contribution for health care, 400000 That is about $3 million. Longevity pay, let me share with you. The average employee for Solano County gets 2.5% at 10 years, 2.5% at 20, and 2.5% at 25. The, the managers get it at 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, and 35. It is unfair to those that are hauling the wagon up the hill. And when the folks at the top are not willing to, to give, that is shameful from this Board of Supervisors. Thank you. Mr. Thompson, first this question is for you. If you are elected, would you be willing to make a motion to reduce supervisors' pay 25% and eliminate the $10,500 car allowance and other perks? Well, <laughs> I think I already said what I was going to do. And remember, uh, in the 11-12 uh, budget hearings, when the board uh, headlines in the local paper, board cut salary 10%. Now, I think I shared with you that ended up being a voluntary 10% pay cut. Vasquez and, and uh, Sparing did not take it. But my opponent, who had opposed it for the previous two years, knew that I was coming out after him. So he decides to take a 10% pay cut. Uh, and county council has, uh, had, has opined that, that you cannot reduce the salary of the Board of Supervisors. Well, I've talked to some of my friends in Sacramento, and when I'm elected, they've offered to carry a legislation that will allow a majority vote, three members, to reduce the salary of the Board of Supervisors. Remember, it only takes three to go up, but it takes five to come down. I'm gonna get that changed when I'm, when I'm elected to the board. And I'm gonna take 25,000 regardless. Thank you very much. The uh, tie of the, uh, the supervisor's base pay and the eligibility for their pay uh, was, so was actually set up on uh, Skip's watch when he was on the Board of Supervisors uh, that um, the 46% of a judge's salary as a way of not uh, voting annually on their, on their uh, compensation was actually something that was done on his watch. Um, the um, the pot, the changing of uh, compensation within a term of an elected official is something that has to be a voluntary act of that individual. Uh, so, uh, and I think it's a contract law that that fed both federal and state law. So. Uh, the car allowance, I actually voted against it, and I actually gave back uh, the lion's share of it. I gave back 8400 of the $10,000 that uh, is the car allowance because I disagreed with it when it was, uh, when it was voted. Uh, the, um, uh, Skip is getting $122,000, $129,000 um, retirement right now, that's uh, well more than double my military retirement. So the, uh, the probability that, uh, that I'm going to be uh, out here trying to outbid people for uh, who's going to work cheapest, I'm not going to do. I can tell you that for the seven plus years I've been on the Board of Supervisors, my office is the least expensive and I am the uh, the lowest compensated board member who is on the Board of Supervisors uh, and have been since I've been on the board. Thank you. Hey, Mr. Reagan, I'll address this question to you. What would you do, if anything, to eliminate travel junkets? 
that aren't needed? Uh, would you support more teleconferencing? Uh, waiting until politicians come to Salado County or use, use of lobbyists. Uh, wouldn't time be better spent at home rather than on a junket? Uh, I don't go to anything other than the legislative committees uh, and the CSAC uh, board meetings in the state. Um, so there's a legislative conference in D.C. that it's an annual trip that I do take. Uh, people think that our members of Congress actually influence much of what goes on in D.C. in the federal spending, and they don't. The decisions are actually made by the people in the departments who allocate what the president's uh, budget request is and how it is executed. The Congress at most modifies 2 to 3 percent of it, and that was in the days of earmarks, and that no longer exists at all. We do uh, get, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars from state and federal government, and it's up to us to actually pay attention to how those things are done and who's making the decisions and to find out how we can influence uh, our programs to actually compete in the most favorable way for the monies that are made available and also to try to moderate some of the uh, strings that they put on some of the money that uh, don't make sense locally. Um, the, uh, so, uh, do we use teleconferences? Yes. Do we use lobbyists? Yes. Do we meet with our members of uh, the state and federal legislator when they're in the area? Yes. Do we invite out federal uh, uh, and state department heads and decision makers in the administrations of the state and federal government? Yes, and we deal with them all the time. Uh, there is an enormous amount of work to be done on that range, and I think we've been doing it uh, more successfully since I've been on the board than we were doing beforehand. Thank you. Well, I think some of our federal legislators would take exception to my opponent saying that uh, they don't affect much change in Washington. But uh, I have a different take on this. I believe that given that we have uh, district offices, uh, right across the street, Gary Manley has his office. I think going back to Washington in these times is not effective. You can go back and you can chat with the, uh, the staffers. That, that may be what you want to do, but I think it's appropriate that we, uh, we not spend money that we, we don't have and that we, uh, we use our, our staff here in, in the uh, in district. Uh, as far as lobbyists, um, lobbyists can be somewhat effective but I want to look at the contracts uh, and, and make sure that we're getting our money's worth. But I want to get back to one thing that my opponent said about my salary. When I take my seat in the Board of Supervisors, I'm taking a 30% pay cut in my retirement salary. If you're serving the, district, the fifth district because of a salary, that's the wrong reason to be running. You ought not be running. Uh, so this is not about a salary. It's about public service. And as far as uh, my opponent's uh, statements that he's taking um, an 18% pay cut, well, if you go onto the website, go onto the, uh, the uh, Secretary of State's website, it shows that my opponent's base salary has not gone down one cent. And it, base salary is what determines your retirement. So uh, when my opponent says he's taking an 18% pay cut, he may have uh, chipped away at the edges, car allowances, cell phone allowance, but he hasn't dealt with the, the real problem, which is the salary itself. Uh, Mr. Thompson, this question is for you. Have either one of you, or both of you, been given the questions before this debate? I can say I have not received any information prior to the debate. Supervisor Ray. Sorry, I I'll speak for myself, I haven't given any out. <laughs> so, our next, our next question. This would be for uh, uh, Supervisor Reagan. You both have uh, stated you support Measure T. Uh, protecting uh, agriculture. 
If that is the case, please explain your position in allowing Vacaville to annex nearly a thousand acres of prime ag land. If Fairfield is wanting to and while uh, Fairfield is wanting to access or annex, I'm sorry, 1,500 acres of ag land. I, uh, I think you're talking about the general plans of both cities to, um, to uh, in the city center growth that we have as a as a as a result of the orderly growth initiative, um, and in our own county general plan when we went through that we actually consulted with the cities about what their plans were within the, you know by 2030 and basically uh, the annexations that are contemplated by Vacaville and Fairfield have been long planned um, the uh, annexations will obviously not occur until the development is actually going to uh, move forward and uh, in uh, the case of Fairfield in the uh, train station complex that uh, goes in there that basically uh, is by no means prime ag land. Uh, it's an awful lot of, uh, of um, cement plants and a uh, bunch of uh, other kind of service industries that are, that are currently in there. There is some grazing land and there will continue to be grazing land. Uh, much of that annexation, by the way, is uh, being dedicated for mitigation banking. All the stuff inside the 60 uh, decibel line around Travis is basically uh, uh, mitigation areas or some light industrial area. Uh, the, the Fairfield area is, there, uh, is what was in accord with their agreement with the environmental world uh, uh, as a settlement of the Lagoon Valley fight that the city of Vacaville had. Um, so, uh, you know, annexations are done through LAFCO. The county has two of five seats on LAFCO. Um, there's a process for all this, but it is all totally consistent with both the county's general plan, the city's general plans, and the Oregon Growth Initiative. Thank you. The city center growth that Mike's talking about was a result of Proposition A, which I was instrumental in passing at the board uh, back in 1995, I think it was. Um, one of the, the problems we have when it comes to annexations, and, and I support city center uh, growth. I mean, it, it is, instead of developing farmland and spreading out your resources, infrastructure, uh, have it where the city can provide the services. The county ha has not and never will have those sor sorts of abilities to provide those sorts of services. But one of the things that uh, occurred to me when uh, my opponent was talking about LAFCO, I, I sat on LAFCO uh, when I was a member of the board, and unfortunately, LAFCO meetings are held at 10 o'clock on a Monday morning. I think they're probably the same uh, time now. And that's problematic for those of you sitting in the audience. Most of you are probably working and can't get involved in those sorts of decisions which really do impact our lives. So uh, if nothing else comes out of this question, I would hope that you're aware that LAFCO meets uh, in, the, in the morning on, on Mondays. If I'm wrong, uh, please check their website. But if you're concerned about annexations and development in your community, then get involved in LAFCO. Uh, try to get them to change the um, the time in which they hold their meetings. And I have a story for you. Uh, my colleagues fought me about changing the meeting time to an evening meeting. And they finally acquiesced after I bullied them enough, I guess. And we had a meeting in uh, Dixon at, at night in the chambers, uh, the city council chambers. It turned out there were over 200 people that showed up. It was a great meeting. People were able to give their input. And, and the staff heard a lot of what the community wanted. And that's what public hearings are about, is about listening to the community and seeing what they, they want, and not what you as elected officials think they want. Thank you. And Mr. Thompson, this question is for you. If given the choice of making pay cuts across the board for everyone, senior management down, to save jobs, would you? I think once we get to a fair baseline, then yeah, we might consider it across the board cuts. But uh, my, uh, looking at a lot of information over the last three or four months, it appears that those at the top have done pretty well in this economy. 
and those at the bottom have really carried the weight of the cuts. And, you know, uh, I sat in a meeting. Uh, I was invited to a general membership meeting when the SEI membership was considering their offer. And what I heard was not, we're not going to give. What I heard was, we're part of the solution, but why do we have to give so much? And so uh, I would think that we would start at the top. Uh, I've identified nearly $1.4 million of pay raises over the last couple of years. We could start there, and someone making $150,000 to $180,000, I think, could more easily accept a 5 or 8% pay cut than someone making thirty-five or 40000 at the bottom. So this is about, about being fair. It's about being fair to those that work for you, about being fair to the, that uh, are at the top, certainly, but being fair to the community that you're supposed to represent. Because every time you lay off an employee or you cut a service, you are hurting the community that we are supposed to be representing. And we're supposed to be making decisions that are best for our communities. And I don't think that simply looking at cut, 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 at the bottom especially, is the way to go. We need to figure out another way, and I believe I've, I'm, on way, I'm on, on my way to cutting part of the structural deficit. Thank you. We have uh, basically gotten all of our employees management through the rank and file line employees to all start paying for the employee share of their PERS uh, retirement. Uh, the county had in the past picked up 100% of, uh, of those costs for our employees. Uh, so we finally got that back, uh, not 100%. Some of the units were only 3% of the 9%. Some were all the way up to the 9%. So it varied by each of the contracts that we had. And thank you for correcting me. Um, the, uh, we basically have capped uh, uh, our exposure to increasing medical costs. We've uh, basically done uh, quite a bit of uh, work on uh, health plan savings, uh, the uh, COLAs uh, that we basically uh, worked on. Uh, basically, if managers are going to be paid more than the people they supervise, the people who supervise managers will be paid more than the people they supervise. And so you're not going to have these kind of egalitarian, uh, uh, socialist kind of ideas about how you basically pay uh, everybody basically the same situation. This is, uh, thank God, not that kind of a country. And um, I uh, don't think anyone here should be supporting those kinds of solutions. Thank you. Supervisor Reagan, this question for you. What is your position on unions supporting candidates? I um, had. Uh, yeah, this this is good because it gives me a chance to correct an inaccuracy in uh, in the last debate uh, where I said that uh, in the last campaign, Supervisor uh, Thompson had been supported by the SEIU by one hundred eighty thousand dollars, and that was wrong. Uh, and I hate to be inaccurate. It was actually uh, two hundred seventeen thousand two hundred dollars. Um, about 73% of all the money he raised and spent in that, uh, or was spent on his behalf in that campaign. Um, I think there's a problem when you have, um, I have no problems with unions having a political advocacy arm, but when it gets into what it was called four years ago, a buy your boss campaign, which was the flyers that were put out. There is something basically wrong about that. Uh, so, do I have a problem with the, with uh, unions having political advocacy? No. Do I have a problem with individuals and unions providing uh, contributions to the people they support? No. When it becomes um, 
overwhelmingly um, uh, disproportionately uh, skewed in these kinds of ways. It's damaging to the public process. It's damaging to the public's faith in what's going on in government. It's interesting. My opponent says he doesn't have any problem with the political arms, if you will, of unions. Well, out of all of the candidates that came before the Central Labor Council, my opponent was the only one to say he would not uh, fight against the paycheck deception initiative that's going to be on the November ballot. And what that does is it takes away any ability of unions to give money to candidates of their choice. The only one out of Democrats, Republicans, Independents. Mike has a problem with unions. You know what? I don't have a problem with unions. I look around here and I see a lot of folks that belong to some sort of union organization. You know, if, if the working class, because they're unionized, is the problem, then we have a problem in this, in this nation. Uh, they help me tremendously, and I will not deny that. But I don't have folks that can write $15,000, $20,000 checks like my opponent. Uh, the garbage companies have been very supportive of Vasquez, Sparing, and Reagan. The th three votes that voted to uh, void Measure E. Measure E was a voter initiative passed some years ago that would limit the amount of garbage imported into our county. My opponent thought that that was not good public policy and supported the model legislation, which would have voided out Measure E. Fortunately, it went down. But my, my opponent seems to realize or seems to forget that those working people, men and women, are part of this community. And as, as I see them, they're part of the solution. And when you take this adversarial approach with your employees, you're going to have nothing but problems. Uh, I want to, since I have uh, 15 seconds here, about public safety. The probation officers in Solano County asked to be, carry a weapon, they're peace officers, because of the new felon that's going to be released into our community. You know what this board said? No, there's too much liability. The probation officers oppose my opponent. This is how he gets back at them. I have a, a question that's that's rather lengthy, and I'm, I'm glad for both of you and your experience in the past to uh, decipher the most important part of the question as we go and, and keep in mind the question at hand. Um, the number two item on the final selection criteria for the 2005 crack looks at the availability and condition of land, facilities, and associated airspace, basically maneuverability. Can they do their job on encroached upon? What steps will you take to prevent encroachment on Travis Air Force Base? Will you protect the decisions of the Solano County Air Land Use Commission uh, on base compatibility on a project, no matter what, even if you want the project yourself? Will you keep watch on the wind turbines uh, that they are de degrading their uh, radar so that a small percentage each time a new project goes up? And uh, will you stand with uh, Travis Air Force Base regarding the joint use land strips? Okay. Did we catch all the points of that question? And I'm sorry, Mr. Thompson, would you lead? Well, I'll try to keep up with that question. Uh, the issue, uh, the question is uh, protection of Travis Air Force Base mainly. When I was on the board, uh, I took great pride in trying to protect Travis Air Force Base. One of the issues that came up when I was on LAFCO was the issue, I'm sorry, one of the issues was the uh, Gold Ridge subdivision. And uh, Mike talked about the 60 uh, decibel lines around Travis Air Force Base. And uh, the Gold Ridge was a little too close to Travis Air Force Base, and we had a heck of a fight at LAFCO, but we prevailed, and we got the Gold Ridge subdivision to move away from the uh, base. Um, another issue that I was intimately involved in was the purchase of the Wilcox Ranch. Uh, 1,500 acres that was gonna be a, uh, purchased by the Nature Conservancy. Uh, I found out, out about it at the Delta Protection Commission, came back to the board, said we need to get involved. A long story short, we entered into an agreement with the city of Fairfield. We purchased the Wilcox Ranch, and in the contract, 
We say that if the Department of Defense or Department of Air Force wants to buy the Wilcox Ranch, they can do it for one dollar. Those are the things that I did when I was on the board and I will do when I'm elected to, as your next uh, supervisor. My opponent, when it came to a Walmart project in Susun, he opposed the, uh, the Air Force and told some of the supporters of the Air Force position to stand down, if you will. Um, when it came to the, uh, the windmills, the, the base was asking for a few weeks time to allow their radar to be adjusted so the, the windmills weren't interfering. I went before the planning commission and asked for a two week delay, two weeks. It was a good project. I, I didn't get a two week delay and the board simply approved the project without any uh, further discussion from the base. Uh, I, I'm a proven uh, protector of Travis Air Force Base. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, issue on encroachment. Uh, this uh, community for decades has, decades has been very, very protective of Travis. Uh, I think we learned uh, after the loss of Mare Island and uh, to not take any chances. The uh, we just actually had a Air Force contractor in Tuesday uh, talking to the county about the protections that we had instituted around the base. Uh, the noise contours, we actually came up with a theoretical maximum mission. It was much more than what the Air Force could ask for. The Air Force could ask for uh, no housing closer than 65 decibels from the runway. We pushed it out to 60. Uh, we've protected much more land. There are no uh, obstacles in the flight path or in the extra potential zones. The comments from the contractors were that uh, of the 14 bases they've done to date, that the protections around Travis from the kind of constraints on their ability to do their mission were the best in the nation. Uh, the uh, the Wilcox Ranch was a was a good uh, catch that uh, Skip found. I commended him in the paper uh, for catching that. And I do wanted to hear basically say that once he found it and he turned it over to Brigetta Corsello, who was running environmental management at the time, and to Sean Quinn at the city of Fairfield, and to uh, Helen Thompson and Maurice Johannesson, uh, who actually uh, basically pressured the uh, Nature Conservancy into the deal that was being proposed, uh, that basically that we threatened their, uh, I was working with Johansson at the time, we threatened their ability to get state bonds to buy the property unless they agreed to the deal. So we have been very protective of Travis. It's a great success story. Thank you. Um, Mr. Reagan, this is for you. What would you do, if anything, to stop excessive use of consultants? Obviously, it's always a debate if we're going to pay for uh, those kinds of things. Uh, we have used consultants uh, on this, like the complicated things, but uh, uh, some of the EIRs and those kind of things, and those are all consultant driven. So there are things, some things that you have in-house staff to do and we have many fewer of those now. And they, we have things that require consultants to get it done. Uh, there's um, excessive use is, uh, is uh, obviously I'm opposed to excessive use. I mean, I don't know anybody who would, who would say they were for excessive use. So I'm, uh, I think the question is a bit of a non sequitur. Um, you know, are there times when you need to use consultants? Yes. Do you need to minimize that where possible? Yes. Um, are there things that I can think of that we're using consultants for now and will in the future? Yes. But I, I think uh, the culture of the county's uh, leadership below the board, in the staff, is they are very, very fiscally conservative. This is a, these, these people watch the Nichols very, very carefully. And uh, I think we should all be quite proud of our county staff, from the line staff all the way up to the managers, 
People are really watching your money, and they're not wasting it. Thank you. Well, I think I'll take exception to that comment. Uh, Solano 360, $4.3 million spent, and the city of Vallejo now doesn't have any money because of redevelopment being um, eliminated. Uh, the center, uh, Middle Green Valley uh, consultants, $1.2 million. The courts found that the, the IR to be inadequate. We're starting over. So consultants, yes, do have their place, but I think you have to be very careful on who the consultants are and what sort of track record they have. But I wanted to get back uh, to a comment about Travis Air Force Base. Um, I worked really hard to protect Travis, and I'm, I'm very proud of what I've done. But I also uh, want to share with you a letter I received from a Tracy Hardwick, uh, Colonel, U.S. Air Force. He says, Dear Mr. Thompson, on behalf of the Travis community, I would like to thank you for being such a staunch supporter of Travis and the United States Air Force for many years. The letter goes on to say that um, the, your action caused the county and the city of Fairfield to preemptively acquire the land which provided the Air Force the flexibility to expand the mission at Travis. Your foresight resulted in a nation-leading policy for preventing encroachment around military bases. That is the sort of work I did. That's the sort of work I'm going to do when I'm elected as your Board of Supervisors. Thank you. Hey, thank you. Hey, Mr. Thompson, this question for you. Regarding the Vallejo Fairgrounds project, what do you think of the money that has been spent so far, and are you in favor of continuing the development project? Well, I hit on it briefly uh, in my last uh, comments. You know, I always thought it was odd when uh, Supervisor Sparing said, we have to be ready when the market turns around. Well, uh, I'm a real estate appraiser, and I, I kind of follow uh, real estate uh, trends, and it is going to be five, 10, maybe even 15 years. The railroad station, the developer is even saying that it, they anticipate a, a, a start date of about 15 years out. Uh, I think it's uh, money that um, was not appropriately budgeted and certainly wasn't appropriately spent. Because uh, if you remember here about three months ago, the consultant, now mind you, consultants are normally hired with a specific goal in mind after they sat down with staff. The consultant came back after a million dollars or so and said, we have to rework this. This is not going to work the way we planned. So um, I, I just find it incredible that we're spending this sort of money in this environment. And I know that these are uh, uh, impact fees that are being used. It can't be used for anything else. But I think we ought to be looking at projects that can put people back to work right now instead of some pie in the sky thing 10 or 15 years down the road. So if I'm going to uh, use the use the money, it's going to be for projects that we can get get you know shovel ready, as they say. If we can get them started, and we can start putting some of our folks to work. Thank you. The uh, project in Vallejo, which I have supported, um, is to take one of the most underutilized uh, properties on the I-80 corridor in the in the entire Bay Area. And it's on the intersection of major highways. Uh, it's uh, got enormous potential. The purpose is to take advantage of the possibility of uh, commercial uses on that to basically refacilitize and restructure um, the county fair for its future. It's a uh, it is a uh, it is one of the, the issues that we're working on to try to do what we can within the constraints to try to create job opportunities in this county. And Lord knows Vallejo needs as many of those as they can get. There is uh, there was an initial stab by a contractor who. Uh, uh, at his own expense, had come in and spent a bunch of money to try to come up with an idea. That contractor failed. Uh, that contractor owned all the intellectual property that had been done. We had to pay to recreate that so it's something that we could use. 
We, uh, in the course of doing that, the consultants that we had doing that discovered that the concept of major destination retail there doesn't make sense that a complementary entertainment, destination entertainment complex that would complement what's at Six Flags and uh, the entry into Napa would actually make tremendous sense. And we, in fact, have uh, some major corporations who are actually expressing interest in it if we can get the entitlements in place. Vallejo's uh, travails are an impediment to that, but we'll work our way through this. Thank you. Yeah, one, one more question from the audience. Um, Mr. Reagan, we'll start with you. And uh, <clears throat> how do you feel about the community? Do you feel like they are a pain in your side, or like a thorn in your side, community or would you? Dogs. I'm sorry. Let's just say community watchdogs. Community. Oh, it is written in there. Sorry. <laughs> Let me read that again for you. How do you feel about community watchdogs? More specifically, do you feel like they are a thorn in your side, or would you openly listen to their comments? Uh, Mr. Reagan, let's start with you. I listen to all the comments. Some are better than others, just like it is in any <laughs> in any uh, human endeavor. There are uh, there are some people like Donald Tipton who's read the packages and has uh, quite does excellent work on uh, on doing that. There are some people who um, uh, emote on things that uh, may or may not be within the jurisdiction of the board of supervisors. Uh, you have a variety of, uh, of um, value based, uh, based on the input, and I listen to all of them um, with equal attention. Um, do I think of that as a, how did you phrase it? Uh, and, and yeah, basically, it's not a thorn in my side at all. It's a part of the public process. It's. Uh, it's people's right to come and address uh, on the issues that are within the jurisdiction of the body they're addressing. And uh, it's by no means an irritant. And sometimes uh, you will have a visceral reaction to some of the things that they say, uh, attacking individuals or attaching, attacking the staff that, uh, you know, it's just part of the life. It's part of being an elected official is to go ahead and welcome that kind of input. Thank you. Community watchdogs. I haven't heard that comment, but I think George Gwynn and Don Tipton serve a great role, and they ought to be commended for what they do in front of the board. Uh, they, they ask the questions that normally most of us wouldn't even know what to ask, and they do it very well and succinctly, and they always make the board think. Um, I, when I was on the board, I, I've told Don this on, on more than one occasion, that his comments before the board during public comment made me change my position. That is what public comment is about, is to listen to what the public has to say on the subject matter and to take their input and evaluate it because you're the elected official does not make you the smartest person on the dais. But one of the things that astounded me um, here about a year and a half, two years ago, I noticed that public comment was limited to 15 minutes in total. 15 minutes for public comment. Then if they went beyond 15 minutes, they put the comment to the end of the uh, agenda. Could be five or six o'clock that evening before you as a public would be able to make a comment about an item on the board agenda. Does that sound like this board really wants to hear what you have to say? And I can tell you that I appeared on a couple of occasions in front of this board. If you have a dissenting opinion, they do not want to hear it. And when I say they, I mean the majority of the board, my opponent and his two friends. You know, I take great pride in saying that when I'm elected, I will listen to everybody. We're not going to have this 15-minute stuff. Uh, when I was a member of the, of the chair of the Board of Supervisors, we limited our, our comments to, I think it was five minutes at the time. But if you needed more time, you got it. That is what public service is about. 
It's about not telling folks what they need to know. It's about listening to what you need to hear. Thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, that, that uh, ends our uh, portion of the um, audience participation. Uh, we're right at 8.25, and uh, as I would ask, with your permission, there are two questions that I'm just kind of dying to get to. Uh, if you'd allow me and, your, um, and the candidates uh, just a couple of more minutes, uh, I would like to ask these questions before their opening statements, or their closing statements, I'm sorry. So uh, with that, uh, Mr. Thompson, this first question would be for you. And uh, if you would start, please. The Climate Action Plan, recently approved by the Board of Supervisors, is based on science that is under review for accuracy. If the future developments demonstrate that the plan is not warranted, what actions can the Board of Supervisors take to avoid continued waste or risk of waste of taxpayer funds? Well, this is one of those questions that I don't have an answer for. Uh, I'm not conversant on the subject matter, and I don't wish to express an opinion that uh, I may have to change at a later date. So I don't have to pass on this question. Uh, climate action plans are uh, been required by the state uh, legislature to be incorporated into um, general plans and uh, for cities, counties. Um, there's uh, a whole variety of things that are in there. There's planning for sea level rise. There's planning for um, uh, different uh, flood risks from precipitation falling in different ways. Uh, there's um, there's uh, all the uh, greenhouse gas emission reduction strategies that are all being mandated by the federal and the state government. Um, do I think that um, climate is changing? Yes, it changes every year. It changes from decade to decade. Do I think uh, anthropogenic, i.e. human-caused climate uh, warm, you know, global warming that uh, is real, and I think uh, that's nonsense. I think uh, the vast majority of it is called by, caused by solar cycles. In any case, it's the law. We have to do the planning uh, that we have done uh, the compliant minimums of what we have to do. And it has, uh, we were actually threatened on our general plan by Attorney General Jerry Brown uh, that he would uh, sue the general plan if it didn't incorporate those kinds of things into it. Uh, if there is uh, actions that are mandated in there that don't make sense at the time within the limits of the state and federal law, we will obey those. Thank you. And for our last question, um, I, would, I would like to say uh, we did have a question in here about tobacco funds, and I'm, I'm a smoker, but there's one question a little closer to my heart than that. Thank you. Um, for decades, the state government has taken on an ever-increasing share of property taxes. And given the supervisor's overwhelming influence on our state government, what will you do? if you're not willing to put up with this. And include in your answer, our schools, please. Um, I'm not sure what the question is. I mean, basically, uh, are, you, are you suggesting that we... What the question is, sir, is the state government has, uh, for decades, been taking an ever-increasing share of our property taxes. This includes money for our schools and other programs within our county. What would you do to change this? Um, actually, the um, the share of property taxes uh, it hasn't changed, and actually, with the redevelopment agency uh, elimination, which I actually think is a mistake, uh, it actually is with the intent of stopping the property tax diversion to the redevelopment agencies, increasing the share of property taxes that would go to uh, 
counties, cities, schools, um, special districts. Um, the amount of property tax that is collected has been set by Prop 13. I would resist any change to that. Um, the uh, if uh, if there is a uh, an initiative that tries to increase property taxes and increases the state's taxes, and I would oppose that. Um, there's not um, there's not a lot. Uh, I mean, if people are are suggesting that we um, not obey laws. Uh, that we're all sworn sworn to uphold. I, I don't see that that's a viable suggestion either. I mean, we have to work to try to get people elected into state government who can influence uh, the state to be doing things in the best interest of our communities, not uh, not the best interest of some of the, of, uh, of the special interests in uh, in Sacramento. Taking on City Hall is pretty tough, and that's what the uh, county would be doing when they're going after the uh, state. Well, one of the things that I suggested when I was a member of the board, and I uh, actually uh, was able to testify in front of Sacramento, was instead of trying to get Sacramento to send directly more money to the county, uh, talking about property tax, why wouldn't we want to consider increasing the homeowner's exemption from the current $7,000? which has been in place since the late 90s, or excuse me, late 60s. Well, what I suggested it, at that time, the homeowner's exemption represented about 25% of full cash value. Why, didn't, why wouldn't we want to use that sort of formula? And it would adjust based on the economy that we've seen. So you could get a homeowner's exemption that could go from 7,000 to, at the height of the market, 27, 30,000, I think it was. You know, those are the sorts of things that I think we can be creative with, and the money will uh, flow back into the counties, and, uh, you know, uh, that would be one solution. There are many others. We, we need to think of outside the box, and if we think we're going to take on Sacramento, uh, that's a losing proposition. So uh, that is one suggestion. I think it's one that helps every, certainly helps every homeowner in Solano County, and um, it is a cost to the state but it's, um, it's a way of getting around them, not sending money to us directly. Thank you. Thank you. That will end our question uh, um, portion of this, uh, this evening. So um, I would like the candidates now to prepare for their closing statements. And uh, Supervisor Reagan, if you'll go first, please. Yeah. Well, again, I wanted to thank uh, all of you for coming and uh, hopefully uh, this has helped you uh, understand uh, the, the candidates better and uh, better inform uh, your votes going forward. Although, from looking at the people in the room, I think almost all of you are aware enough about what's going on that you've made up your minds long before you got here. Um, too many people uh, talk about what's wrong in America, what's wrong in California, what's wrong in our communities. and. They spend a lot of time talking about what's wrong and, and not about what kind of solutions we should be pursuing. Here in Solano, uh, for the last seven and a half years, we've been talking about implementing solutions, uh, and I'm actually quite proud of what we've been able to accomplish locally. And, uh, and that's understanding that the solutions are not going to come from the state or federal government. There's no deus ex machina that's going to reach in here and solve our problems for it. It's going to be us making our own decisions and pulling ourselves up by our reduced bootstraps. We've got the advantages in this county. We've got the location. We've got water. We've got the infrastructure, the roads. Uh, we've got uh, a diverse industrial sector and growing more diverse as we speak. And we can take advantage of that to make a better life for our kids, which is what we all, this all ought to be about. And uh, we have been succeeding, despite the Great Recession and the mediocre recovery that we've all been exper uh, experiencing here. Um, this campaign is about leadership, uh, keeping your word to the voters, making tough decisions to protect taxpayers, and doing what local government can do to help local entrepreneurs 
lead our economic recovery. Uh, I've been trying to lead by example, and I've been fortunate in that the board has followed uh, some of the directions that I've tried to lead in, and the county staff has picked up the ball and carried the charge. Uh, we have achieved a lot. We, we protected taxpayers' money, we streamlined county government, and we protected our public safety programs. Um, leaders uh, don't talk about over and over and over what's wrong. We actually talk about what it is we're going to do to make change and make things better. Um, Solano County's future depends on our ability to work cooperatively to find those solutions. The kinds of summits that we've held and the kind of uh, work we've done with uh, with regional agencies is an example of how we're going to find these things. This job is about both public and uh, both public service and public trust. I would be honored to continue representing this district, and I hope you vote in June. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, you've heard a lot tonight. You've heard a lot of numbers from me, and um, I just want to harken back to a time when I was the assessor. Talk about an article that was written in the back of a reporter. It says that two months into Skip Thompson's new job, the assessor recorder has streamlined the organization and cut in excess of $52,000. But it goes on to say one thing that I think is extremely important. The reorganization that Thompson uh, uh, took on makes good on a Thompson campaign promise to streamline the assessor recorder's department. You've heard a lot of reasons why I don't think my opponent deserves the right to represent you on the Board of Supervisors. I've shared with you my $3 million plan. I've talked about cutting the board salary by $25,000 for each supervisor, cutting the car allowance, cutting the administrative leave by about $800,000, longevity, certainly for elected officials, they shouldn't be getting longevity. Their longevity, our longevity is getting reelected. So this is a, a campaign that comes down to two things in my opinion. Leadership and trust. And to know, tonight I hope I showed you the leadership needed and, the gain, and to gain the trust that's required. Thank you very much. That concludes our, our uh, meeting tonight. First, I would like to thank the Taxpayers Association for, uh, for setting this up and, and moving this forward. I would like to thank uh, Stephen Powers for opening the meeting for me and uh, the members of the newspaper uh, for vetting these questions. Most of all, uh, I would like to thank you, the audience, for your participation, you at home, friends and neighbors, and uh, I would like to once again introduce your candidates because these are the guys who have put their lives uh, in basically the open uh, to expose their fundamentals, their ideals, and their passions with regards to government. Find out who they are. They're your candidates.